Welcome to the Grace of Eugene podcast. We exist to help every person in our sphere of influence to encounter Christ, experience biblical community, and extend God's kingdom. You can learn more about us at gracecityeugene.com. Here's the podcast. Well, it is a, it's really fun to be with you guys. Um, if you have met before, I am a from up in Corvallis, or sister church up there, and um, one of the uh, dreams that I had many, many years ago, back in the uh, in the Pete days of Corvallis, uh, when he was up there, was um, was the idea that our church, which was perpetually an airport, you know what I mean? People taking off and landing just all the time. You know, you just they're there for a layover, year two, three, four, you know, something like that. But it's you're getting, you always had to get used to not only saying hi, establishing them. Just get to the point where you actually love them, not just love them because Jesus loves them, but you love them because you actually like them. You know, you get right to that point, and you're like, where are you going off to, you know? And it always was a dream of mine that there would be sister churches of ours uh, up and down the I-5 corridor, and within, especially within the Northwest, um, where when people were to land in those cities, there could maintain a sense of relational connection and, and bond. And uh, it's just been a huge thrill to see you guys here established in Eugene, the work you're doing on the campus, and then even our church up in Portland uh, as well. Um, it's been really awesome to see so many faces that stay connected and that are able to go uh, back and forth between uh, that 40-mile distance between Eugene and here. And uh, so that's just been amazing. I bring you greetings from all your brothers and sisters up there. Very excited about uh, you guys and everything going on down here. Uh, I don't know about you guys, but we are enjoying this new season in the fall. It feels like a fresh time um, coming out of pandemic. It feels like a fresh moment that the Lord is doing some unique things. Um, And uh, we're very excited about all of it. And we want to see God do everything that he is indeed going to do. Um, And it's a little bit about what I want to talk to you guys about here. Um, I know you guys are in a DNA series. You're exploring not only who you are as a church, but what you're part of as a church family. And we're a part of a family of churches called Every Nation Churches that spans the globe. Um, there's roughly like 80, 90, somewhere in there. Maybe we've hit 100 in North America. Um, but there's some like 1,000 to 2,000 somewhere in that. I know that's a very wide ballpark range internationally. Uh, I feel like I should know it better than that. Uh, but sometimes churches, especially in different contexts like Southeast Asia uh, and West Africa and so forth, they multiply so quickly. It's just like, I don't know how to keep track of those numbers. So anyway, uh, 1,000 to 2,000 ish, uh, with our headquarters being in Manila, of all places, um, which is really exciting. Uh, that's uh, because one of the things that has, is happening now in real time is the shift of the gospel that has been uh, just going across the entire globe ever since the days of Jesus. And um, obviously, there's been Christians all throughout the globe, and the gospel has gone in every direction, but where the centrality of kind of the home base of Christianity has been started in Jerusalem, but carried west through Eastern Europe and then into Western Europe and then across to the Americas. But even in our moment and slice of history, it's even uh, going further into uh, East Asia and uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. And uh, so most Christians, like in the world today, don't, don't look like me anymore. Um, and the, what's exciting about that is to see Christianity continue to do what is very uniquely good at doing which is impacting uh, cultures and reaching people from every nation Um, and getting to be a part of that kind of a family where the work and labor that we do here as disciples of Jesus and loving one another is part of a bigger vision of the same uh, people doing that in their own context and then being joined into that as a spiritual family. Really, really exciting. Um, One of the the greatest honors of my life has been getting to serve um, with a uh, a graduate school that we developed uh, within our denomination for some of our leaders across the world. And I teach uh, biblical theology, and I promise you not to bore you with any too professory kind of stuff here today. Um, But I've had about 30 students in my classes over the last two years, and uh, just It's the most humbling thing to stand in front of men and women who are better than you. (laughs) Like like almost every category, they are better than you. Like I I have more letters behind my name than they do, but they are better than me in the kingdom in like every other way. It's very humbling and also very exciting. Uh, I can Bible nerd on them a lot, and then they appreciate that. But then when we actually sit down for lunch and they're, ah, Professor Seth, you know, whatever their accent is, you know, uh, they want to know all these questions about the Bible. But the truth of the matter is, like, I want to know their stories. And I hear stories about baptizing Taliban members on the border of Pakistan. Like, uh, you hear stories about the greatest outbreak of revival happening in the world today, Iran. 
Uh, and we have Iranian pastors that are in and out of prison, miraculously being delivered from death sentences there, like baptizing people in public fountains because they have just stopped caring about the government. You know what I mean? Like, we get to hear those kinds of stories. Like, I have, I have these students in my class, you know, and it's just it's absolutely incredible. Um, one, of, uh, one of my students last year was uh, he's from uh, Krakow, Poland. And when the Ukraine got invaded, all the refugees started flooding into Poland. And how well you know your geography. I didn't know my geography at all, but it turns out Poland is right next to the Ukraine. So, like, um, so now his, his church, which was a mega church in, in Polish standards, uh, and that was about 150 people, has now just exploded to about 400 people. Uh, and they have multiple translators in service with multiple languages because they have so many refugees. They're on call. It's just these beautiful, amazing stories that for as incredible as it is to serve God here in Oregon, um, it's amazing to be a part of something larger than ourself. And the mission of every nation is simply to honor God and to establish Christ-centered, spirit-empowered, socially responsible churches and campus ministries in every nation. And what I want to talk about is that simple word of establish. What does that mean to continue the work of Jesus and seeing the love of Jesus spread specifically through churches and campus ministries that can carry this specific DNA uh, to impact the world? Um, and uh, to see uh, men and women's lives get touched to such a degree that they'll actually just abandon everything else in their life for the cause of Jesus. Uh, super fun. Super fun to be a part of, um, and I don't, I don't want to get left on the sidelines. As much as I love getting to serve and see what's happening in global context, and, um, and as much as I hear the cries of our post-Christian culture sliding further and further away from like, the depths of Christianity, like, man, I don't buy it. Uh, and well, I buy it in one sense. I know culture is shifting, but what I don't buy is a sense of, like, that I'm going to somehow relegate the power of God as being irrelevant or, or impotent. You know what I mean? I think God can and does and will still move. In fact, I believe the eyes of the Lord range to and fro, and he's looking for hearts fully devoted to him that he might pour out his strength and energy into them. That's what I believe. I believe the harvest is ripe, but the workers are few. I believe that's still the fundamental problem that Jesus prescribed in his day and that remains in ours. Uh, and so I, I deeply believe that God wants to establish more Christ-centered, spirit-empowered, socially responsible churches and campus ministries. And I'll just dial it in, into the state of Oregon, into the Pacific Northwest. I love it here. Of all the opportunities I've had to move from here uh, for school, for jobs, other opportunities, I just love it here. It's, uh, I just can't imagine the kingdom of God's going to get much better than Oregon on a nice October day. You know what I mean? This is, uh, this is it to me. This is, this, is, uh, this is the real deal. And so I want to uh, walk this through what it would look like for, uh, especially coming out of a pandemic, that we might participate and be part of on a practical level. And especially at a church like this, it can feel overwhelming to think, well, like, how are we going to do something so grand? But I promise there's people far less prominent or important or privileged or gifted as you um, that are just being obedient to King Jesus and watching Jesus do incredible things as a result. So with that being said, you guys, let's go to the book of John. That's where I want to open today. We're going to start in the book of John. We'll go uh, chapter 20. How's that sound? Sounds good to me. We'll do that. No, I planned it. We'll do, definitely do John 20. Uh, we'll start from verse uh, 19. Verse 19, just a little bit of quick context here. This is uh, after Jesus' resurrection. His disciples have been hearing the rumors of the resurrection, and now they're about to have an encounter with the resurrected Jesus here. So they're back in the upper room that they had been in prior to the crucifixion, and they're kind of all huddled in. When guess who shows up? Your boy and mine, Jesus. Verse 19. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and he stood among them and he said, Peace be with you. And after he said this, he showed them his hands and then his side, and the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. And again Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them the Holy Spirit. And he said to them, receive it. Just receive the Spirit of God. So, Father, we're asking this morning that we would not only hear these words, but we would receive whatever you want to give. In Jesus' name, amen. So, 
And Jesus launches his movement from this uh, critical point. There's a few different moments he had with different various groups of his disciples where he commissioned them and he launched them. And this is certainly the one that John dials in at because it's the most intimate. And there's a few dynamics going on to this thing that I think are really, really cool and really powerful, especially for, uh, for where we are in our time right now. And specifically, when Jesus launches this uh, terrified group of people huddling together in a room with the doors locked from the inside, and eventually he's going to launch them to send out what is now this global movement of Christianity that has reached hundreds of millions, if not billions, of people uh, for Jesus and has spanned culture and language and geography and oceans, like the whole deal, to launch this the kingdom of God movement, it all starts from some frightened, <laughs> like cowardly uh, disciples with the doors locked on the inside, who had been told again and again that Jesus purposed to die and then to rise from the grave, and now on the rumors of the resurrection are sitting in fear. Not like, I knew it, <laughs> you know? Not like, I, you know, not as if they were anticipating this, not as if they were excited for this, not as if they were sending, as if this is a surprise to them. And it's with this group that G Jesus is going to launch something so grand and so every time I get a little overwhelmed with the thought of God's call in my life or what he wants to do through my life or what he wants to do through my church, I always come back here and I say, like, well, surely I'm better off than this. My starting place is a little bit further along than them. Um, Jesus was just fully convinced the way to build his kingdom was not by filling stadiums of people and preaching a generic message, but by the investment into the few, a deep investment into those that could be with him, receive from him, and then to go out into the world as a result. This is what he believed, that Jesus would really double down on his commitment, and he would have this moment with them, pronounce his peace to them, let them see like the holes in his hands and his side so that their faith and their belief could actually rise up again, and then to breathe on them the same Holy Spirit that was breathed into him at his baptism, and launch them in the same way that he was launched by his father. Uh, Jesus believed that making disciples was the key way to reach the world, to establish his church throughout the world, to establish churches that would do incredible, miraculous things, even greater things than he would do according to his own words. He believed it was about making these kinds of disciples that would have moments like this again and again and again. Moments where they would be in Jesus' presence, receiving the Spirit, and being launched out to their purpose in the world. There's a quote by a guy named Neil Cole, uh, who wrote a book on discipleship, and it's kind of like, like, buckle up for this one. Uh, it's kind of been like gutting me a little bit, uh, as I've been processing it over the last summer or so. Um, but here's what he says about discipleship. He says, ultimately, each church will be evaluated by only one thing. It's disciples. Your church is only as good as her disciples. It does not matter how good your praise, preaching, programs, or property are. If your disciples are passive, needy, consumeristic, uh, and not moving in the direction of radical obedience, the church isn't good. And I think about how much time and energy and work and thought that not just I myself, but I know that many churches put into all the other categories and yet this seems to dial straight, right into the truth of the matter, that Jesus was launching disciples that would be radically obedient, um, not radically popular, um, not radically wealthy, not radically intelligent or educated, but obedient. And this, you guys, at the end of the day, is all Jesus is going to judge. This is it. This is it. And let me tell you, I don't know if there's been anything more convicting in the last several years for my life. And uh, I, I tend to be a little bit codependent at times. I like to be liked. Who doesn't like to be liked? I enjoy being liked. And I enjoy telling people things that they enjoy hearing. But when I ponder and consider the weight of what Jesus desires to do, I can't help overcome that Jesus desires to see disciples that are not living as people just being told what they want to hear, but that are receiving truth spoken in love to them, that would actually raise them up, that they might be the kinds of people that would receive the Holy Spirit and be sent into the world in the same way that Jesus himself was. This is how Christ-centered, spirit-empowered, socially responsible churches and campus ministries get planted over 
every nation. When ordinary men and women simply come to moments with Jesus, receive the Spirit of God, and choose to go in response. It's very ordinary. It's very simple. It's not over any of our heads. Jesus took ordinary fishermen. He took young boys in our standards, men by theirs, boys by ours. John was the youngest of the disciples, and he was roughly around the age of 14 when he started following Jesus. And he's just convinced. You think of all the foolishness of the disciples. How many times Peter put his foot in his mouth? You think of Peter almost like ruining the whole crucifixion moment by starting a war, like by chopping off a dude's ear in the Garden of Gethsemane. These guys were so slow. And Jesus was committed to them that even after his resurrection, yet they still didn't quite get it. He's yet commissioning them to be the seedbed on top of which everything else gets built. So here's, uh, here's the three dynamics of this moment that I would love to see get renewed in your midst. I think that this fall is a bit of a unique moment. It feels like a post-pandemic moment, a truly post-pandemic moment. It feels like the smoke of the last few years is starting to really clear. But what I am deeply hesitant to do is just press Control-C, Control-V on what 2019 was. I want to press in to all that God has for me, all that God has for my church, for my small group. I want it all. I don't want to just go back to whatever I thought was normal. I want to follow Jesus into whatever he has now. And it feels like now is a moment of renewal. Everything in me has wanted to call uh, my church back to radical discipleship. The only problem is I just have this real ax to grind with the word radical. Because I think what we call radical, Jesus calls reasonable. <laughs> like, like, so, like we want to categorize it because the second you say radical, then all of a sudden it's like, yeah, the 1% of Christians, they'll, they'll jump into that. The real Jesus freaks. They'll go for that. And everyone else can just ride the coattails of normal. But I think Jesus just calls things reasonable. You know you do crazy things when you're in love, right? And Jesus just calls us to love God with everything that we've got. And when you're most deeply, deeply in love with someone, your life will probably look a little radical. It'll be very inconvenienced. You'll do things you wouldn't ordinarily do. And it's not because you're pressured to or you're trying to perform or you're trying to out-radical someone else, you know what I mean? It's just you're in love. And it just happens. I would love to see our discipleship renewed, and I think Jesus lays out the pattern time and time again. You can see it all throughout the three years he invested into his disciples, but I just see it so beautifully summarized right here in this passage as he's about to launch them out into the world. So here's the three things I want to unpack. I want to unpack being with Jesus, receiving from Jesus, and then unlocking the doors. Being with Jesus, receiving from Jesus, and then unlocking the doors. The first one is probably the most important one. That our discipleship to Jesus, our Christianity, the very core of everything, is about being with him. It's not a set of ideas. Christianity isn't a life philosophy. It's not a rule of living. It is about being with Jesus. From the very beginning of the world, God made humans to be with him. Humans' rebellion literally walked away from him relationally, but God has been in hot pursuit ever since. Christmas, which is quickly approaching, praise be to God, <laughs> Um, is, is most noted by Jesus coming as Emmanuel, God with us. That he is the gift. That's why we even give gifts at Christmas, because of the amazing gift of Jesus at Christmas. That even the idea of heaven in the Christian conception isn't this reward we receive for a life well lived, a place where the beer flows like wine, you know what I mean? And we get every just like uh, sensual or like pleasure-filled indulgence that we want without hindrance. The vision of what eternal life looks like is to be with Jesus, unencumbered. That's the vision, which I have no doubt there will be pleasures and desires fulfilled and really good things happening because God gives every good and perfect gift, and he is a God of abundance and generosity. He's a great father that knows how to give good gifts, and if you know how to give good, give, give good gifts, do you not think he knows how to give better ones? So I, do, I believe that there's going to be amazing, amazing delights in God's presence, but the greatest and most central aspect of it all is him. It's him. It's being with him. The disciples were noted as men who had been with him. In Acts 4, when Peter and John actually go heal a dude, and it stirs everything up, it becomes very controversial, because how dare you? You know what I mean? How dare you? How dare you help a man walk? You know, that's just not polite. Uh, 
And what they noted about him when they started to investigate this terrible, like, infraction of uh, polite society was that these men were ordinary, unschooled, but that they had been with Jesus. When Jesus called even the 12 disciples to him, the very purpose of it was that they might be with him and that he might send them out. He just hung out with the guys. He was just in their presence. And there's something about being with Jesus that just forms us and shapes us in ways we are hardly ever cognizant of. But it's the whole point of everything that God desires to be with you. And when the presence of God is with you, it changes everything else about life that you know. It changes the peace that you present, that you are actually approaching life with. It changes like your perspective to know that I'm never actually alone. And when God with you, when you're with Jesus, it absolutely renews your heart and your mind. It's the beautiful gift that Jesus gives that we're not waiting for some reward to come, but we get to enjoy it now. It might feel like an appetizer, but it is, it is something we get to look forward to of more of what we already have, not something we don't have yet. We're with Jesus. And secondly, we receive from Jesus. One of the cool things about being with Jesus, I would imagine, and just receiving from him continually And especially in this moment where he breathes on them and says, receive the Holy Spirit. Well, Jesus at the beginning of his life had the Holy Spirit uh, poured out on him. And now here he is pouring out the Holy Spirit on his disciples. So what you're getting to watch in real time is Jesus closing loop saying, everything I got, you get. Everything the Father did for me, he's going to do for you. Every bit of power I got, you have. Every bit of love I got, you have. In fact, here's, okay, you want to have your like brains melted a little bit? When Jesus is praying at the end of his life, he tells his disciples that he is going to share the love of his Father with them, meaning this. Jesus didn't just come to be the bridge to reconcile you to the Father, the one to kind of bring you back into relationship with your heavenly Father. It's like, Pete, here's the Father. Father, here's Pete. You guys can now go on and start your relationship together and have a great time. What Jesus does is he shares his perfect relationship with his Father, with you. As the Father has loved him, so that's what he shares. You don't get rookie love from the Father. You get the intense love of the Son of God and the relationship that they've always shared. You get to be brought right in Christ to the center of that love. That's what you're receiving. When Jesus breathes on them the Holy Spirit in the same way he received the Holy Spirit, he's just closing Luke. Yeah, everything I got, you get. All the love, you get. Everything, you get. And then everything I've done, you get to go do. And how did Jesus go about the life that he lived? Well, one of the things the Gospel of John also tells us in John 5 was that Jesus says, I only ever do what I see the Father doing. He said in another context, I only ever say what I hear the Father saying, meaning this, Jesus so deeply invited in the love and presence of his Father that he never saw himself as initiating or coming up with any original content. He never created some new ministry. He just simply stepped out in what he saw his father already doing. So when Jesus says, receive the Holy Spirit, he's sending out his disciples in the exact same pattern. You do not have a mission. God is actually already on mission, and he would love for you to participate. But here's one of the coolest things that you get to do. You get to wake up every morning without, you don't get to ask God, what do you want me to do today? You don't get to come up with some really long to-do list of all the amazing things. I'm going to feed the poor. I'm going to care for the homeless. I'm going to pray for the lost. I'm going to love my wife and love my kids. I'm like, you don't have to come up with some really long list of everything you're going to do for God. You get to simply do what Jesus did and say, Father, what are you already doing? Because I'm not stepping out in the world as if I believe I am the catalyst for ministry. I'm not the beginning of the work of God. I'm just stepping out into the world where the work of God is happening everywhere. I'm just often blind to it, obtuse to it, thinking about me and my world all the time. But when I say, Father, what are you doing? I'm just receiving Jesus and the Holy Spirit and walking in the same way that he walked. Father, what are you doing? And now life becomes about a little bit of an adventure. God, who have you placed in my path? Where are you already working? One of the things about Christianity is how overwhelming it can easily be. In fact, I believe that the gift that Jesus is pouring out here of himself and the Spirit is what liberates us 
from what many Christians, sincere Christians, encounter? Burnout. I've done extensive research on uh, spirituality discipleship and its convergence with mental and emotional health. Got a doctorate on the way (laughs) with all that. And all the literature will tell you that burnout is not a function of how much you're doing. It's the emotional weight you carry as you're doing it. And here's what Jesus liberates us from. He liberates us from the path of burnout that eventually has to just withdraw. And spiritual life can feel like this sometimes. It's like I'm doing a lot, I'm doing a lot, I'm doing a lot, and then I get a little tired, a little resentful, a little bitter, and so then I just pull away. Or like in school, you just procrastinate, 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 pull an all-nighter. We just overfunction, we overfunction. We overfunction, then we underfunction. We go really hard, and then we just step away altogether. Have you ever noticed this in your spiritual life? And how many of you ever told yourself, like, yeah, I'm a procrastinator, but I do my best work under pressure? <laughs> I used to tell myself that all the time. And then I went to counseling, and I got called a liar. So, <laughs> turns out, turns out, no one does their best work under pressure. You're just fueled off the adrenaline when you don't have any other option. But Christianity isn't fueled by adrenaline. It's fueled by grace. The grace that confronts the things you're avoiding in your procrastination. The anxieties, the fears, the insecurities that are actually holding me back. The belief that somehow I have to do a million things for Jesus. And so that we just, we just avoid. And we avoid. And we avoid. Rather than just simply asking, I'm not called to do a million things for Jesus. I'm not called to plant a church in every nation. I'm just called to ask, Father, what are you doing? And participate in that. I wish it were more complicated than that. It's hard to justify my job at times because it's not much that much more complicated than that. If my people just asked that and did that every day, I think I'd be out of a job. I'm pretty sure I'd be out of a job. You know what I mean? I'd have to go do something else. Father, what are you doing? And then just go do that. There's uh, an amazing quote by Ted Lasso. Have you ever watched the show? He's an American football coach that gets hired to coach a soccer club uh, in England. It's quite humorous. And when the... uh, something like really horrible happens in the middle of the show at one point, one of his uh, assistant staff says, like, coach, I think it's time to hit the panic button. And uh, in his nice little, like, charming, like, southern draw way, he says, like, fellas, there's only two buttons I never like to push, you know what I mean? Snooze button and the panic button. Because that's life. It's either snooze or panic. Snooze and panic. And we either live in this disengaged lethargy or this adrenaline, like, pushed like panic, neither of which is the life of Jesus. And Jesus says, peace I give you, and then receive the Holy Spirit. And at what point, here's one of the things I love about Jesus. I've been rereading the Gospels, and it's totally the thing. Sometimes, like, Jesus is kind of like a great little, like, jewel or a diamond, and every time you turn it in the light, you see a little different refraction of, like, who he is, an aspect of his character. Read through the Gospels and try to find one moment when Jesus is panicking. Or pressing the snooze button. What's amazing is he can walk into a crowded, crowded room filled with hundreds of people, all with desperate needs, all crying out at the top of their lungs, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. People that need healing. And he can go like a heat-seeking missile to one person in a crowd and deliver the very need the Father has for him. And what's shocking about it is he could turn his back on thousands of people to do it. He could stay in a village, minister all night long, wake up early in the morning so that no one knows about it, to go spend time with his father, and then leave the village before anyone else wakes up, walking away from tons of people who never had all their needs met because he's just, Father, what are you doing? And he's just keeping in step with him. He's not saying, well, the need's here so great. I guess I'm just going to do this for now. I guess I'll just have to delay the cross. I guess I'll just never rise from the dead. I'll just stay here forever and a day. No, no, no. He says, Father, what are you doing? And he just stays in step. And Jesus walked a life in three years that would have burned most of us out in like three hours. But he was with his Father. He received from his Father. And he's just constantly in tune. Father, what are you doing? I'm just going to do that. One of the the tricks of the trade, sorry, Pastor Chris, I'm going to give away a couple things here. But uh, one of the tricks of the trade uh, is of a pastor is just looking confident. 
I've worked really hard at my confident look. I can sit with uh, people like in my office or a coffee shop, discipleship, whatever sort of moment, and I've got this really great face I've been working on that tells you that like I hear you, I understand you, and I can help. You know, like, it's just like, I have empathy, I have compassion, and I'm like, don't worry, you're in great hands. Uh, but I develop this outside face to mask what's going on typically on the inside of my brain, which is usually, uh, oh, dear God, <laughs> like, I have no idea what I'm doing. In fact, the most, like, humorous thing that ever happens in ministry is when you meet people and they come to you and say, like, oh, Pastor Seth, I, I want to step up, I want to lead, I want to serve. Like, man, I I've got a friend, they're going through a hard time, but I just don't know what to do. I don't feel like I've been trained for this. I don't feel like I'm equipped for this. And I just, in my head, I'm just laughing hysterically. I'm like, yeah, join the club. Because if Christianity was simply a product of having been sufficiently trained, do you know how many needs there are out there, how diverse they all are? I mean, you've met one sinner. You've met one sinner. And usually what's going on whenever I'm with anyone is an internal dialogue that wants to panic because I have no idea what I'm doing. And who can I call that would know what they're doing? But instead, the Father has taught me to say, Father, what are you doing right now? And every time I ask that question, he usually helps and I'm not trying to just give the quick little piece of advice or tell them maybe a part of my story to see if it lines up with theirs, but I'm just listening and say, Father, what are you doing? One of my favorite uh, Christian counselors was a guy by the name of Larry Crabb. He's like one of the goats. Well, unfortunately, passed away a couple years ago, but he's with Jesus now. I don't think it's unfortunate for him. I think he's doing great. Uh, but uh, Larry Crabb is dope, wrote a lot of books. I'd recommend almost all of them. And uh, he, uh, he's a PhD, clinical psychologist, family, licensed marriage family therapist, like one of, one of my favorites by far. And he tells a story time and time again that when he's meeting with clients and listening to all of their issues, the thing he's always telling himself is, is wow, these people need professional help. <laughs> like, Sam, if you ain't professional, we're all hosed. You know what I mean? This is not going to go. But it's the same story. We think that somehow following Jesus is about knowing enough or having enough or been experienced enough. And in reality, it's just about being with Jesus, receiving from Jesus. And the best thing we receive from him is this relationship with our Father, trusting that he's already working. He's already moving. He's already in action. I just want to figure out how do I step into that? Um, one of my favorite moments of this was um, <clears throat> several years ago, we had a new couple that was coming to our church. And every time this, uh, the, uh, the husband would show up to the church, he did not look like he was having a good time. So the room wasn't a whole lot bigger than this, the church that I was preaching at back at that time. So it, like you couldn't avoid faces. I, I saw all the faces. So, and so I would see him every Sunday, and either he looked like he had a death stare, like he was going to murder me, or he was falling asleep. It was literally one of the two. Like, that was, that, was, that was the emotions he had. It was like, death to you. I was just, like, that was it. Like, option A, option B, every Sunday. And I kept thinking to myself, like, why do you keep coming to church if you hate it so much? Um, and uh, so one day, like, I just got out the courage, and I went to him. And I just said, Father, what, the, what is going on? What are you doing? Why are they here? Can you just make them not here somehow? Because this is really uncomfortable for me. I haven't had God answer that prayer request once, by the way, just in case you're interested. Make it more comfortable for me, God. <laughs> it's like, did you say less comfortable? Is that what I heard you say? That's, that's usually about how my relationship with Jesus goes. So I, I come up to him, and I'm listening to what I feel like the Father's saying. And I said, uh, so I've noticed some things. I've noticed that I don't think you like being here. And, uh, and the guy looks at me, and he says, yeah. It's been really hard. It's like, well, uh, tell me about it. He says, well, I came from a cult background. Organized religion is really hard for me. And um, every time my wife wants to go to church on Sunday, I hear these voices in my head telling me, stay away. Don't go there. And just screaming at me and cussing at me and just terrifying me to go to church. And so when I'm in church, like those voices just get so loud sometimes, you know? And I know it's, you know, I just, I'm just either trying to like concentrate or focus or like I just get so tired, I get knocked out. And the Father led me to pray for him, and I just prayed. And the next week he comes back and I saw him smile for the first time in church. He says, Pastor Seth, I don't, I don't know what you did, 
All I know is I haven't heard the voices since. And I want to give my life to Jesus. I wanted to avoid him so hard, <laughs> so badly. But I asked a simple question. And I didn't even have to do anything. Just prayed for him. Just prayed for him. Time and time again, I've watched God move. Now, I can tell you not all my stories are superhero stories. I have one other of my favorite stories. I was uh, trying to lead a guy to Jesus, and uh, it was kind of one of those dudes that, like, he just kept showing up. Like, I would see him at the grocery store and then, like, the auto parts store, and it's just like, hmm, are, we, are you stalking me? Kind of a moment. It's like God's clearly putting him in my path. But uh, at one point, I got up the courage to actually ask him out to, like, lunch, a little mandate, and uh, we go. And I know I want to bring up Jesus in the conversation, but you know how like, like uncomfortable that initial kind of Jesus moment can be, at least for me. For some of you, you're great at it. And so we talked for about two hours. Pleasant, nice, superficial things. I really liked the guy. He seemed to like me. It was all going great. Food was good. Two hours later, he looks at his watch and says, oh, dang, I got to go pick up my kids right now. But I'm really disappointed because I was hoping we would talk about Jesus. Right. <laughs> Gotcha. Because I oftentimes feel like a scared disciple in a locked room. Graciously, it wasn't my only shot. We had lunch again the following day. That's the third part. It's not just being with Jesus or receiving from Jesus, but notice they're hiding in a locked room. It's locked from the inside. Christianity sometimes feels like a prison but not one that's ever locked from the outside. And to be the kinds of disciples that renew our discipleship to Jesus, to really encounter the presence of Jesus and enjoy him in worship and devotions and community and life groups and to really let the life and love of Jesus pour into us, to receive from Jesus everything he wants to give, the spirit of God, faith and energy to go into the world. There also has to come a moment where we settle, I'm going to unlock the door. I'm going to go do something uncomfortable. I'm going to do something I think is scary, but in reality, it's actually exciting. I'm going to go do something where I'm just going to punch my fear in the nose. You know what I mean? And I'm going to watch what God does as a result. What's shocking to me is not that Jesus had to change the world. He didn't have to overcome Roman governments, all the unjust laws. He never, like undid all Christian persecution that his church ever faced. He does very little to dictate the terms of how the world operates because the problem facing the church is never about the church being in prison. In fact, read the book of Acts. Christians being imprisoned is never really a problem. They're never actually imprisoned. They're just worshiping in there. And when God wants to let them out, he just kind of lets them out. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's really not a thing. The real problem the real problem is when we lock the door from the inside. For the same reasons they do, they're scared. They're intimidated. But when you say, Father, what are you doing? You realize even the most intimidating people? I have staff members. I have pastors on staff who used to come to their life group with balled up fists refusing to talk. Very intimidating. But sometimes on the outside, what looks like intimidation is just the last death rattle of someone holding on to their own life before they surrender it to Jesus. I know that was my story. But when you know, you know what I mean? And you know that God's after you. And then you kind of give that last concerted effort to try to hold on to control of your life, you know what I mean? And sometimes we interpret that as intimidation and disinterest, when in reality, sometimes it's the very evidence that God is most powerfully at work. We are those to be with Jesus to receive freely from Jesus and then to courageously unlock the door and see what he has for us. I don't know if this wouldn't renew our discipleship to such a degree that you and I couldn't participate in this grand adventure where the greatest stories told in the world don't come from some other continent, but come from Lane County, come from the U of O, come from ordinary people just asking simple questions. Like, Father, what are you doing? What are you doing? How do I participate? And just one step at a time. And when we do that, that's all we ever do. When we get to see Christ-centered, spirit-empowered, socially responsible, churches and campus ministries, not only get established in places like here, but who knows what God's going to do from here? Who knows what kind of seeds he'll launch from here? 
It starts in this simple place. And I want to call us, especially to what has felt like the locker room of a pandemic for a few years, back to the place, being with Jesus, receiving from Jesus, and unlocking the door. Father, I'm asking in Jesus' name for a fresh encounter with you. I'm asking that this uh, time that we have remaining together be one where your spirit would really touch our lives again. Would you refresh us? For those of us that have brought in just a lot of stress and anxiety and worry and fear, those of us that have brought in just a lot of burdens, Father, I'm asking in Jesus' name that you would come and breathe on us that the fullness of everything you have would be poured out into us. As the love of the Father is perfectly poured into the Son, be poured into us as well. And Father, would you reveal if there's anywhere that the, uh, the door's been locked or our lives have been a little smaller than you've desired them to be, where fear has been Lord instead of you. And we're just asking, God, we're asking that your presence with us might give us courage to step out again. And we trust you for this. In Jesus' name. Hey, thanks for checking out our YouTube video today. We appreciate you taking the time to tune in with us. Before you take off, please hit the like button. And if you want more of this content and you want to be notified when we put out new videos, hit the subscribe button and the little bell for notifications right next to it. We'll look forward to seeing you next time.